the next talk will, will be a talk in which uh, Guillem Aromi, professor at the University of Barcelona, will try to convince us that the molecular approach of using magnetic molecules can be one possible approach to design quantum uh, bits for uh, applications or, or for, for, for being integrated in systems for quantum computing, for example. Then it's what he will try to, to show you, to show us that uh, we, we can have spin molecules and the spin molecules can play a role that can be interesting for, for this for, for playing this game, for, for entering in, in the game in which the molecule can exhibit uh, long quantum coherence and also can uh, one, two molecules can be coupled or uh, two spins can be coupled in such a way that you can have a Q, Q gate and not only a qubit, but also the, the next, uh, that is a Q, Q gate for making operations. Then, Guillem, let's go. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for Eugenio for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to be here after a few years. So it's fantastic. And also thanks for this uh, great introduction because uh, I think it's the best introduction I ever had on the topic I'm going to, to explain. So I really, really appreciate it. Uh, so well, I'm Guillermo Romé from the University of Barcelona. And so this talk is uh, on lanthanide uh, molecules. So it's going to be a talk on chemistry uh, and uh, chemistry for, for quantum compute, computing. So it will be, uh, I hope, uh, a lot of chemistry and a little bit of quantum computing, uh, which uh, I'll try to make it uh, uh, attractive uh, as I find it. So um, as I mentioned, we are for synthetic chemistry and we try to find use so, uh, by studying our molecules and with our collaborators uh, uh, of these uh, systems for things like uh, the topic of today. So I'm going to, to, to introduce very, very uh, um, uh, quickly a, a few concepts of quantum computing. As you know, quantum computing is uh, already somehow uh, taking place and uh, it will be a, a true revolution uh, in information processing. So currently we, we use classical computing. So we exploit uh, microscopic states of, uh, or, uh, of systems to encode information and do logics uh, with them. And the minimum is uh, the bit, which is a, is a system that can be in two states and that we call zero and one. So quantum computing also uses two, two states to encode information, but those are, those are quantum mechanical states. So uh, quantum state zero and quantum state one. Uh, so we could do the, in principle, the same logics, but there is a whole range of uh, uh, resources that are inherent to quantum mechanics that can be exploited to process information, which of course are not available in classical computing. So the possibilities of doing uh, uh, information processing using quantum, quantum systems are infinitely larger. So that we can address problems that are not think, that we can even think to address with classical computing. For example, uh, one of the properties of uh, quantum mechanics is that a system can be in a state zero and in state one, but also in any uh, uh, superposition of these two states. So if you manage to control these things, you can do really incredible things when you manipulate uh, these, uh, these quantum systems for information processing. So the idea is to find uh, the physical systems that will allow us to do that, to control this, and then to take advantage of it uh, uh, in performing, uh, in performing uh, uh, quantum algorithms. So we need uh, physical systems uh, for the most basic, uh, let's say, uh, procedures. We need uh, uh, systems that have two levels, as I mentioned before. Uh, we need to be able to um, uh, scale them up so we can put together very complicated uh, uh, systems and to perform co complex algorithms. And a very important thing, the quantum information that we manipulate needs to be around for long enough so we can indeed uh, use it and process it. So that comes down to say that we need quantum systems that exhibit long quantum coherence. If the quantum information is lost before we can even process it or manipulate it, we, we cannot use those systems. So the physical systems we, we have to think about to, 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 to bring this to a reality 
uh, have to have long coherence time. And this is one of the problems that uh, exist uh, in, 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 in finding a good technology for, for, for this, uh, to develop these um, uh, this, uh, um, prospects. So one of the, uh, fortunately as chemists, uh, uh, the propositions of using uh, chemical systems, specifically the spin, the spin uh, uh, hosted by molecules to, uh, uh, to embody these, uh, these quantum bits, so the, the, the spin states would be the quantum states that we could use to, uh, perform, to, pro to perform quantum computing. And uh, of all the many possibilities that exist that, that uh, are actually being worked out and studied, we find the spin hosted by lanthanide metals, okay? So lanthanides in their, in their, uh, in their ground state term, they have a series of uh, crystal field states that present themselves many, very often as doublets, very often as doublets, where the ground state is uh, very also often uh, well separated from the excited state. So this uh, doublet in the ground state could be used as the two level system that we need for quantum computing. So there's been a lot of work performed on, on understanding the quantum coherence of uh, lanthanides uh, are within, uh, within chemical environments. Uh, these systems are interesting because uh, of course, chemistry allows to make molecules with a large diversity of properties. We can modulate these properties. We can uh, um, investigate the best conditions to find high coherence by again doing chemistry. So uh, the, the scalability becomes an, in principle no problem because, because we can produce uh, thousands of quantum bits that are identical and ideally process them and uh, locate them where, where we need. So these are the kind of problems that now we are, we are trying to, to face. And so in terms of lanthanides, there's been a lot of work, as I mentioned, on understanding the specific properties of, uh, of uh, individual qubits, very, uh, for the most part, uh, quantum coherence. But uh, to do quantum computing, we need to go a little uh, one step beyond, which is putting qubits together to do quantum uh, algorithms, uh, logic gates. And so what, what, what we've been interested in our laboratory is to work with more than one qubit to make molecules with uh, more than one qubit in order to think about the possibility of using molecules for complex, more complex uh, um, operations, uh, multi-qubit quantum gates, okay? So I'm gonna show you very quickly. There is a, there is a very typical or a very, let's say, uh, fundamental quantum gate, a two-qubit quantum gate, which is the so-called c naught quantum gate, which consists of two qubits that must be different from each other one is the control, the other one is called target. And this quantum gate, this logic operation, what it does is uh, flipping the state of the target only if the control is in a given state, like for example, in the up state. So this is uh, the uh, operation, the quantum gate that uh, this signal quantum gate realizes, this conditional quantum gate. And so if the control is up, the target goes down. If not, the target just doesn't move. Okay, so this, this is the control, uh, the signal quantum gate. And so uh, our, our, our question is, can we, can we prepare a signal quantum gate in the laboratory? So basically, how do we do, how would we do this? So what do we need? Uh, we need a molecule that has two lanthanides that are different, control and target. They must be interacting, for example, through a weak magnetic interaction so that they, the target knows uh, what the control, uh, uh, where the control is. And so, uh, of course, uh, if, they, if, if they are coupled, coupled uh, well, we will have a ferromagnetic state with a different energy than the anti-ferromagnetic state. In the absence of a magnetic field, we have uh, two doublets that are the generate. And if we apply a magnetic field, of course, the ferromagnetic state would would uh, have two different energies depending on the orientation with respect of the magnetic field. But also the antiferromagnetic state will split because since these two qubits are different, uh, there, there will be a non-zero um, mag magnetization or non-zero magnetic moment uh, as a result of this antiferromagnetic coupling. So this allows us to uh, determine or establish four magnetic states in the presence of a magnetic field 
that constitutes the, the computational basis of this signal quantum gate, the four states that I mentioned before, the four states that we need to do this quantum gate. And so for a given energy, uh, for a given energy uh, quantum, for a, uh, for a given frequency that we can use to produce excitations, we just modulate the magnetic field so that for this energy, we have specifically the resonance or the transition corresponding to the C not quantum gate. So we need to have this within one molecule, okay? Okay, so how do we have this within one molecule? Well, it's very simple. We just need to have a molecule with two lanthanide metals with a weak coupling, which is uh, straightforward because uh, uh, the coupling be between lanthanide metals is, is known to be very weak. So that's perfect for us. But the important thing is that they have to be different. So we need to some element that are in, imposes some asymmetry, some difference between these two metals. If we use an asymmetric ligand like this, uh, that would do it. But it is important that we don't have, for example, two ligands uh, head to tail, so that renders this molecule symmetric. So fortunately, this is not the case because uh, this ligand with this uh, with uh, lanthanide ions, what uh, does is uh, surround, surrounding two lanthanide ions in a way that we have three ligands around these two lanthanide ions. So having three ligands that are asymmetric necessarily uh, makes one metal different to the other. So we, we have what we need, but, okay? So this is pretty much the end of the story, uh, but not. Uh, <clears throat> well, we, we did this, uh, we did a long time ago, uh, this chemistry with all the metals of uh, the lanthanide series. So we have um, characterized all of them by single crystal X-ray diffraction by using sources of uh, different so simple sources of lanthanide. So uh, in principle, any of these would, would be a good uh, C0 quantum gate. So in fact, we showed uh, by studying uh, or in detail the case of the terbium uh, that indeed it, it, is a, it, it gathers the conditions of a, of a, of a good prototype for a, for a C0 and another two qubit quantum gate called swap and published that a, a long time ago. But uh, we could go one step beyond because as I mentioned, um, we made an entire series of molecules. And so we were able to study in detail all these, uh, the, the structural properties and, and parameters. And what we realized here we have, uh, these numbers are the number of F elements, uh, electrons, F electrons of the lanthanide that is making these molecules. So, each, each, one, each, point of, each one of these points is a molecule for a different metal, from the lightest one to the heaviest one. What we represent here are the uh, bond distances between the metal and the donor atoms around this metal within this molecule. So what we see is that these distances, as we go along the series, as we put F electrons, as we make the lanthanide uh, heavier, uh, these distances decrease and this is the effect of the so-called uh, lanthanum contraction. This is some, a well-known effect. So uh, the lanthanides uh, become smaller as they are heavier, okay? We see that. But what we see also is that uh, for all the molecules, always there is a difference between the bond distances in one position with respect to the other one. So this is a quite significant and quite uh, peculiar behavior where we see a con constantly a gap between both uh, let's say bond distances, no matter which lanthanide we, we're looking at. Even if in the ensemble, uh, the, the, bond, the bond distance is going down, this gap is maintained, which shows us that in this, uh, let's say, coordination environment favors somehow in one position, metal, should favor in one position metals that would be larger than in, than, than in the other position. Okay, and so the immediately as a synthetic chemist that brought us the idea that this system could be used to uh, spontaneously discriminate or separate metals of different size uh, uh, in two positions of this molecule. So that could be a way of making uh, heterometallic lanthanide complexes, which is something Mm, difficult to, to do because uh, lanthanide, uh, the series of lanthanide ions, uh, 
they have very different properties, uh, optical and magnetic properties, but uh, chemically they behave very similarly. Lanthanides are very difficult to separate. Uh, this is one of the problems that we have uh, uh, being able to obtain pure lanthanide uh, compounds because they're difficult to separate from the mixtures as they come uh, in nature. So this is also a, a something that is a challenging uh, process uh, synth synthetically. So this uh, provides us with the opportunity of doing, doing this uh, with quite a lot of success. In, indeed, we, we've been able to prepare a large collection of heterometallic compounds, which for the most part are quite pure. They become less pure when lanthanides are much uh, similar in size. But nevertheless, the, the resolution or the selectivity of the system is, is very remarkable. And I'll show you some examples of how that is. Okay, so uh, one of the ways we look at uh, the mm, good selectivity of the system is by ex examining the mass spectrometry. Uh, here I see that the gray trace is very, is very, uh, uh, is, is, is very light. Uh, usually I see it as uh, a bit uh, darker, but basically it, the gray trace is the experimental one. And what we see for uh, many of the compounds is that there is only this, uh, this signal and no signals on these positions. The color signals are simulations for the different metal distributions. So we compare our experimental mass spectrum with what we would expect for three different uh, possibilities, the heterometallic one and both homometallic ones. And when we see zero or nothing here, absolutely here, that means that our system is very selective. And that happens for a large number of cases. Um, okay, so uh, another way of showing uh, how um, selective uh, this system is, is by showing this series of compounds where we prepared uh, all the combinations of praseodymium with the rest of the metals. So we obtain all these compounds and we obtain the single crystal structure of all of them, okay? Praseodymium with anyone else. So basically what we see is that praseodymium, which is a relatively uh, light metal, is the, 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 the third one of the series. This is, these, are, these are the uh, parameters for the bond distance parameters for the praseodymium homometallic. So as I mentioned before, we have two types of distances in one position and in the other. When prosodymium is together with a, with a larger metal, with a, a lighter metal, it takes the position of the small metal and lets the other metal to go to the, to the large position. Now, as soon as we combine prosodymium with a heavier metal, a smaller one, it just takes the position of the large metal this time and lets the other position to the small metal. So the distances of prosodymium remain pretty much the same for this series of compounds, whereas we see how the, the distances, the bond distances to the other metal keep contracting uh, as expected from the phenomenon of lanthanum contraction. So the gap in fact becomes larger and larger and larger as we combine prosodymium with a smaller metal. So this is also a very powerful demonstration that this system is very, very selective and, and is able to just put each metal at, the, at its place, so to speak. Okay, so of course, uh, from the point of view of exploiting this for, for quantum computing, now that uh, gives us a large array of possibilities so we can study the system that you, we might think is uh, optimal. In this particular case, we study the erbium cerium combination as a possible c not quantum gate. So we made a compound. And so in order to evaluate the exact Mm, let's say uh, properties, uh, the magnetic structure of the system to see whether it could be used as a signal quantum gate. Well, we studied in detail the, the, the magnetic properties of this, of this compound, but also we could study uh, specifically the magnetic properties of each of the qubits, erbium and cerium, at uh, the environment where they are found themselves in the, in the, in the molecule, but avoiding the influence of the other qubit. How can we avoid the influence of the other qubit? Well, by making the compound where in the other position, there is a metal that is non-magnetic. So since we can play around with metals uh, very easily, we could study erbium by just making the reaction of erbium and lanth uh, lanthanum, the corresponding lanthanum salt, 
So lanthanum is just diamagnetic. So uh, we could study the properties of erbium. The same for, for cerium by making the reaction with yttrium as the small metal. And so then uh, um, we can study individually both qubits uh, and see, for example, here, this, this is uh, some work done uh, uh, in Zaragoza by a colleague, uh, uh, Fernando Luis, at very low temperatures. Uh, this, uh, this work allows us to characterize the doublet, the doublet of, this, of, the, of each of the qubits, of the erbium in this case, of the cerium in this case, as I mentioned. Also the, by EPR, this, this set of data allows us to make a good characterization of the qubits uh, and also compare the addition of the, of the properties of these two qubits with uh, the, the same, the same uh, response from the actually both qubits when they are together in the same molecule. And so, for example, here we see the effect, for example, of the, of the coupling. And this is the sum of both qubits when they are separated or when they are isolated. And this is when they are in the same molecule. See, this is the effect of the coupling. Uh, and also we see that the EPR is not uh, simply the addition of both EPRs. And so uh, by just uh, modeling with simple models, the, the, uh, the magnetic properties of this, of this molecule, we can, we can um, propose or make a, a semi-quantitative uh, diagram of energy of uh, these magnetic states, of these four magnetic states I mentioned at the very beginning uh, with uh, respect to the magnetic field and see at which point we can uh, run the C0 quantum gate. So by using a specific uh, energy, which is the one of the EPR spectrometer that, uh, we, that we have. And in fact, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is an uh, EPR. This is a so-called echo detected EPR. Uh, so that means we detect the signal uh, the, the transitions that take place as we uh, move the magnetic field by using uh, an experimental protocol that uh, depends on the fact that the system exhibits quantum coherence. So this is a very good thing to see an echo detected EPR for a potential qubit or qubit quantum gate because it is already telling you that the uh, system is coherent at least for some, some time that can be long enough for your interest. And so you determine the, the, the coherence time also through certain experiments. In this case, uh, by looking at the uh, uh, echo, echo de decay of, uh, of, uh, of the echo detected signal. And so you, you, can, you can estimate the quantum coherence, which we did for this system. And so this transition here is the one that I showed you earlier was corresponding to the C0 quantum gate. So the one that turns the target uh, if the control is up, okay? This, this, is, this is this transition here. Anyway, so that's quite a lot of fun for us, uh, even if we don't understand everything. Um, our colleagues do, so that's fine. Um, and so uh, from, again, from the, from, the, from the laboratory, we were able to exploit this uh, methodology, uh, which relies, I didn't mention that, but uh, why, why, uh, is, uh, some, why are the distances in one side larger than in the other side? What is the reason for this? Well, the reason is that uh, in this coordination system, we see around the metals combinations of these chelates, uh, these tridentate chelates, with these uh, bidentate chelates. So if around the metal, okay, if around this metal, you have a majority of uh, these larger chelates, with respect to these uh, smaller ones, the bond distances would be larger than uh, in the opposite case, in the case where uh, the, 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 these, uh, the identate chelates predominate with respect to these uh, other chelates. So here you see tridentate chelates here and here and here are the, the, uh, the identate chelates. So depending on the ratio between these two types of chelates, you will favor longer distances or smaller distances. And so in, we used uh, this combination of ligands to obtain another type, another molecular type, which again trapped three metals in uh, coordination environments where we see different combinations of these uh, two chelates uh, in a way that, uh, for example, here we, the central metal 
favors the large uh, or the central position favors the larger metals and the external position favors the smaller the smaller metal so we have a new heterometallic uh, type in this case is trinuclear where we have one metal larger different from the other two and so this system happens to be even more more selective this is a collection of compounds we made so far we having troubles a little bit of trouble crystallizing properly them so we go a little bit slower but we made quite a few of them already here is a mass spectrum showing how really i mean indicating how really selective this system is so it's even better um we we also were able to show this through dft calculations okay so well this is the same kind of mass spectrometry experiment i show i showed before and so well, well sorry for this <laughs> um uh, so this uh, this larger let's say more complex molecules could be then exploited to do more complex operations so this is where our friend a colleague uh, stefano carretta in the university of parma uh, who's been working with this uh, with us on these uh, topics for a while uh, he, he he imagined that this uh, that this molecule which is here represented at a b a a b and a okay the, the the central the central one and the two side ones he thought that this molecule could be used to to perform a so-called error correction protocol so he said okay we can use the, you can we can use this molecule to have the central one as a qubit and then to have two ancillary qubits that would the ensemble would allow us to correct an, an error if there has been an error on this central qubit. And so how we do this? So basically what we need to do is to run a protocol, to run <clears throat> a series of transitions every once in a while to see whether our qubit has experienced an error or not. And so that means to, to uh, produce a certain of transitions, uh, EPR transitions, between the, the eight possible states uh, uh, within this all possible states or within this molecule and so by by doing this uh, in principle you should be able to correct uh, uh, an error okay this is a little bit too complicated to explain now but those are as i mentioned those are transitions those are for example these are c not quantum gates so quantum gates between pairs of qubits this is a quantum gate that involves the three of them but this is a quantum error correction protocol so of course uh, what do we do with this and so basically what we need to do is the following we need to take this molecule in this case we use this particular one and we uh, put uh, we display the, the simplest possible spin hamiltonian the one that works with all the 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 all the up and down states of the of the ground state doublets of these three metals when they are interacting uh, with each other so by by considering only the ground state doublet this is the hamiltonian that we that we obtain okay so this uh, these are the the, the zeeman terms of the three uh, doublets these are the in these are the terms for the uh, interactions between them so it's it's the simplest possible hamiltonian we we can imagine of this system and so our, our job is to try to obtain the parameters of this Hamiltonian and see whether uh, with these parameters and also measuring the quantum coherence, this could be, a, we could do this protocol with this molecule. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. Okay, so basically, let me just finish. Uh, we, were, we did that study by studying no, each qubit independently because as, as before we can have uh, the molecules with di together with diamagnetic molecules i'm sorry metals so the cerium studied with lutetium diamagnetic itself the erbium studied with lanthanum which is diamagnetic so we could compare all the all the magnetic properties compare it with all the 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 quantum gate itself obtain the parameters the define the the the, uh, the um, energy diagram and see that uh, we could do all these operations that re are represented in the in the in the quantum error protocol and this is just a demonstration that uh, well I don't have time to explain this but our colleague said okay with this Hamiltonian indeed if we run this protocol we are able to correct uh, an error on the central qubit I don't have time to explain this but they were satisfied with uh, this 
Hamiltonian parameters. So this is our qubit embedded into a circuit that uh, you know sh sh shall be used for uh, uh, quantum computing with an error co correction protocol embedded into the molecule. Anyway, so uh, the conclusion is that we, we found a very nice synthetic protocol to make heterometallic complexes. We could try to exploit it for demonstrating at least theoretically these, uh, these operations, dinuclear, trinuclear. Just let me thank uh, the people uh, that have been involved with this uh, at the synthetic level, uh, the, the characterization, the uh, calculations, and also the simulations. And so I thank uh, all the various agencies for, uh, for funding and thank you for your attention. <laughs> okay, then <clears throat> thank you, Guillem, for, for this uh, nice talk that is also a, a complement, a, a continuation of the talk of Roberta. She was talking about uh, uh, the coherence in single uh, atom or single molecule systems. Here is how you can not study the coherence, but in that case, try to, to put two centers together or three centers together in order to make a quantum gate. Then we pass from quantum bits to quantum gates. But remember, these are crystals, like in the case of Roberta, to go to single molecule system, real single molecule system, we are still very far. But well, in any case, this is uh, the step by step. First, you need to have the compound to make the compound stable and to make the compound after uh, study in some integrated devices in which you should integrate at the end single molecules if you are able to do that and to maintain uh, still the properties. Then we are still for having these three steps, single uh, qubits, qubits, and integration in devices. The, these three steps, we are still far from the last step where we are trying, but not with single molecules. Then it's a, it's a work in which chemists are involved strongly and also physicists for trying to, to integrate in single molecules and to measure the single molecules to make the measurement and after also to make all the theory that is needed to understand how we can uh, operate with these kind of systems. Then is uh, uh, what he has shown is the chemical effort to do that, but there are other efforts that are theoretical efforts as he has shown, and also we need at the end also processing efforts. Then, questions? Okay. It's really very interesting talk. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, however, I, I, I was wondering uh, how would you go from this toy model uh, uh, for us uh, gates? Uh, if you want to go to a device, you need to transfer a uh, uh, to do multiple operations uh, to transfer a, a quantum state from somewhere to your molecule. How I, I, I was not able to yeah, imagine well, how is, would you uh, do, do that? This is a very good question and it's a critical point. Um, so, in, to prepare quantum states, in principle, you you can you can uh, exploit uh, EPR pulses and exploit the. Uh, the, the, the quantum properties. So this is this this should be possible. But uh, the most difficult thing is to to actually to exploit it in a in a meaningful way. So to address them, to read them, to have different molecules communicating with them. And so this is a problem that uh, it needs to involve not only going down to the molecular level, which is already in itself uh, extremely challenging but also uh, to integrate those molecules into another, let's say, technology, uh, into a, let's say a hybrid architecture where you can ha have the possibility to go into, uh, go into the molecule, uh, having molecules interacting with each other and then obtaining information. This of course, uh, uh, well, chemistry has to do with uh, trying to provide good conditions to achieve this, but then you need to work with people that work with these other uh, uh, um, devices, for example, quant quantum resonators. So you can couple molecules to these quantum resonators and okay. then uh, even manage to have molecules pass information to each other. This is something that it's, 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 being, it's, being, um, it's being studied, it's being investigated, but I think we are far away from that stage. But that, that, that should be the, the, I mean, this is the, the, the goal. Otherwise, uh, we're not doing anything with this model. And th these resonators, you, you were meaning uh, uh, to, to transfer the quantum state optically to the, your molecule. 
Uh, yes, I think okay. this is a, this is the most sensible way to go, and okay. people are actually going in this direction. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There is any other question? Yeah. Thank you for the really interesting talks. I have just a curiosity. I've seen in the XRD structure that uh, there is always present also pyridine. It is useful only to obtain crystals or it can influence also the properties, maybe changing the colleague and the, the properties will change. Yeah, it is a chemical issue. Basically, we found that uh, working with this not very friendly solvents, uh, pyridine acts as a, as a ligand and then uh, allows us for the crystallization. Uh, we, we, we know that pyridine uh, in the solid state uh, might go away uh, or you put these systems in, another, in other solvents, uh, might be a change by other coordinating solvents. But uh, in terms of the single crystal structure, we only have that with pyridine. But there, is, there should be nothing special other than that about pyridine. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then we thank again now uh, Guillem and Afghan.